hey everyone welcome back to my channel so in this video i'm gonna do dermatology questions with you guys because my test was a bit heavy on dermatology and also nbmes bring up these questions a lot and it works for both step one and step two so yeah let's get started so the first question says an eight-year-old previously healthy girl is brought to the office by her mother due to hair loss on the scalp the first thing i need you to do guys whenever i have a derm question is to look at the picture first it usually says it all like a spot diagnosis and then read the thing so here we can see an area of hair loss this is very important so you need to remember all the causes of hair loss Plus, I can also see some scaling and look at the demographic as well. This is an African-American girl, right? So these are important pieces of info. Right. Several weeks ago, the mother noticed the patch of hair loss, which has progressively enlarged. The mother also says that the girl frequently scratches at the area. So guys, hair loss with itching right the child recently changed a different school has been anxious about new teachers this is just a distraction to show you it might be due to stress but it's not okay skin exam findings are shown in the image below there are several enlarged tender occipital and post auricular lymph nodes this is kind of a giveaway that it's an infectious cause if it were something else if it were for example due to stress or anything else it wouldn't show enlarged lymph nodes the fact there's enlarged lymph nodes means it's an infectious cause right this looks to me like tinea capitis or scaly ring worm which causes hair loss with scaling and itching this is very characteristic of tinea right so the correct answer is dermatophyte infection but i want you guys to know why the other answers are wrong like why isn't it for example autoimmune disorder here the question means autoimmune disorder here refers to alopecia areata which shows a completely clear smooth area of hair loss there is nothing else wrong in the scalp it's completely clean and this is not the case here Plus, if it's an autoimmune disorder, you wouldn't see scratching of the area, right? You wouldn't see scales. So, no, this is not the case. And obviously, you wouldn't see enlarged lymph nodes. This indicates there's an organism, right? So, it's not alopecia areata. Now, cutaneous candidiasis is completely far off because this usually presents as a rash in moist areas of the body or skin folds. And it doesn't affect the scalp and doesn't lead to hair loss. This is an example of cutaneous candidiasis. That's not the case here. Seborrheic dermatitis affects people mainly in at puberty or young adulthood when the sebaceous glands are active, not in a child, right? Uh, because sebaceous glands are under control of androgens, so it would be more in young adults. So, it usually presents like dandruff, something like that. It doesn't really lead to hair loss. Like anyone who has dandruff, their main problem is not hair loss, right? And also, it will be found along the skin fold as well, where there is a lot of sebaceous glands, for example, around the nose. And finally, repeated hair plucking refers to trichotillomania. It's a neurotic disorder. Some people uh, keep like pulling their hair and it usually shows like this it's just hair loss there is no itching there is no enlarged lymph nodes there's no scales and it will show something like that so the correct answer is c All right let's move on to the next question uh, look at the picture first guys for spot diagnosis it saves you a lot of effort i can see here a deep pigmented patch so it most likely is a case of vitiligo Right, so we have kind of cut short the diagnosis just by looking at the picture. And then we're going to read. A 22-year-old woman comes to the office due to a skin disorder. The patient has a five-year history of patchy deep pigmentation. Note here, guys, the duration uh, primarily affecting the hands. Like if it were an infectious cause or anything else, it wouldn't be for five years, you know. Uh, patchy deep pigmentation. 
not hypopigmentation, deep pigmentation, primarily affecting the hands, feet, and face. Uh, some of her lesions have resolved, but overall she has experienced a slowly progressive course. The patient has no pain, no itching, no erythema. All of these exclusions or negative symptoms exclude infectious causes or allergic causes, right? Medical history is unremarkable. Her only medications or contraceptive vitals are normal. Physical exam like this one. So this is vitiligo, in other words. Which of the following diseases is most likely associated with this patient's condition? You have to remember, guys, that vitiligo is an autoimmune disease. It's autoimmune destruction of melanocytes. So that's why you get a deep pigmented, completely deep pigmented area. And therefore, it is associated with other autoimmune disorders. So what you should choose among these choices is one condition that is also autoimmune. The only one I can find here is Hashimoto thyroiditis or Graves disease if it were in the choices. So cho just choose any other autoimmune disorder. For example, if in the answer choices you have alopecia areata, if you have pernicious anemia in the answer choices, if you have rheumatoid arthritis, you're going to choose it. Now, hyperparathyroidism, no, it's not autoimmune. Um, Zollinger Ellison is due to a gastrinoma. No, this is not autoimmune. This is part of MEN1 syndrome, multiple endocrine aplasia. Type 2 diabetes, no, it's not autoimmune. If it were type 1 diabetes, I would have chosen it. But the only autoimmune one here is Hashimoto. Or if it was Graves' disease, I would choose it as well. All right, moving on to the next question. A three-year-old boy, and I want you guys to know here the demographic. This is a child. It's not an infant, not a teenager, not an adult, it's a child. So you need to exclude anything seen in infants and stuff like that. So that's how important the demographic is. A three-year-old boy is brought to the office by his father due to rash on his bottom for two weeks. The father states he has been scratching his bottom during the day. We have tried several over-the-counter barrier ointments and antifungal creams to soothe the air, but nothing seems to help. The fact that these types of medications did not help excludes their causes. For example, guys, barrier ointments are used for contact dermatitis. So if it didn't work, then he doesn't have contact dermatitis. Um, antifungal creams are used for candidal dermatitis. So if it didn't work, then he doesn't have it. That's the importance of saying these pieces of info the child is toilet trained during the day but uses diapers at night the fact he only uses diapers for a short period of time only at night should exclude for example contact dermatitis because of diapers you know the patient usually stools twice a day without straining but for the last few days he has had pain with bowel movements and blood on the toilet paper after wiping no recent illnesses no chronic medical conditions his eight-year-old sister had pharyngitis a few weeks ago, but is now recovered after antibiotics. Now, this is a very important point, guys. The fact his sister had um, bacterial pharyngitis, most likely it's streptococcal pharyngitis, means he has someone, he con has contact with someone at home who has streptococcal infection, right? Very nice. Keep this in mind. Uh, temperature is normal, physical exam is normal, but shows a bright red, sharply defined rash that extends two centimeters circumference around the ends. There are two fissures in the perineal region. What's the most likely diagnosis? I brought a picture from the web, even though it's not associated with the question, but this is what it might look like. The fact, guys, that there is fissures, you should always put this in your head when doing derm questions. Whenever it mentions fissures, right away, equals streptococcal infection like it's a giveaway when it says fissures with a rash or anything it means streptococcal infection just keep this in mind just memorize it so here's what it might have looked like you know sharply defined and there's also fissures and bleeding so the fact that um antifungal creams didn't work we said excludes candidal diaper dermatitis and this is what candidal diaper dermatitis looks like, guys. 
Number one, you have to know that it involves the skin folds because Candida likes moist areas, beefy red, plaques, and also there are satellite lesions outside the lesion. And here's how it looks like in real life. I'm not sure why the picture went away anyways. Irritant diaper dermatitis would be more likely if the child was wearing the diaper the whole day, but he only wears it at night, so it's really unlikely. Plus, it will look like this. It will spare the skin folds, and that's what differentiates it from candidal dermatitis. There is also no satellite lesions. That's how it looks in real life. So, still no. Right. Uh, seborrheic dermatitis is very unlikely in a child and it doesn't come in these areas anyway. It comes in areas where there is a lot of sebum or sebaceous glands such as the face, the scalp, and more in um, teenagers or young adults when you have a lot of androgen that affects the sebaceous glands. So the most likely diagnosis here is streptococcal perianal dermatitis. There is so many clues to this. Number one, fissures. Number two, the fact that other medications for other conditions didn't work. So barrier ointments, which are usually uh, used for irritant type of dermatitis, didn't work, so it's not this. Antifungal creams didn't work, so it's not candida. Simply those two are more seen in infants that are wearing diapers for the entire day. But this is a child, three-year-old boy. He only wears diapers at night, very unlikely. And the fact that he had contact with a case of strep pharyngitis at home, his sister had pharyngitis, treated with antibiotics, also proves that it might be streptococcal. All right, moving on to the last question. And I want you to look at the picture first, like we always do with any derm question. I'm sure a lot of you might have already thought this is a hemangioma or a capillary proliferation but which type exactly it's very confusing the choices so a five month old girl below age one and I need you to note this is brought to the office by her parents for evaluation of a skin lesion her buttock her parents initially noticed a small red macule several weeks after her birth so they noticed it a short time after her birth and they thought it was an insect bite but after applying cortisone cream, it has progressively enlarged, all right? So it started small and now it's getting larger, especially over the last two months, within the first year of life. This kind of scenario is very characteristic for specific uh, birthmarks, which is strawberry hemangioma. It's called strawberry hemangioma or superficial hemangioma. Uh, now, a lot of you might choose cherry angioma because it looks like cherry, I don't know. But let's see all the differentials for this condition. So these are three possible birthmarks you can see in a baby. The first is nevus flamius or port wine stain. This one is almost always unilateral. So you're going to see it's, it's called it respects the midline. So you're going to see only on one side. And this one doesn't fade away. It can blanch when you press on it, but it doesn't fade away. And this is usually seen with, um, like, either on its own or sometimes with Sturge Weber syndrome. Nevis simplex, this one can go away with time. It fades with time. It's usually seen in the middle and on the glovella or the eyelids. But the one we're talking about here, which our picture looks a lot like, is this strawberry hemangioma. This one is raised and it grows within the first year of life rapidly and then regresses after the first year of life. This is the typical presentation. Now, usually we don't do anything with it, just observation. However, sometimes we have to do, we have to treat it. We have to give propranolol, uh, which is a vasoconstrictor, right? because this is a vascular proliferation because if it comes on the eyelids for example it can lead to squinting or affect vision 
right? So in this case, you have to treat. You don't can just do observation, right? Also, if it comes on the face or any area that is cosmetically sensitive, it can ulcerate, you know? So you also need to give treatment. Also, if it comes on the trachea, it can affect the airways. Only in these conditions can you give treatment. Otherwise, you can do observation. So what about the cherry angioma? The cherry angioma doesn't even come in children. It's seen in adults. And you can notice here that this is adult skin. And there's small stuff like cherries. And they can be multiple. You can get a lot of them. So it's completely not the case here. And by the way, this is the port wine stain on the one side of the face. Respect the midline. And this is the nevus simplex on the glabellan eyelids. And it goes away with time. So our case here is superficial hemangioma or strawberry hemangioma. Now you know. All right, guys. So hope this makes sense. Let me know what you think in the comments.